Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Otis Noble III. I am the Assistant um, Director of Community Engagement for the Division of Social Sciences here at UCLA, and this is LA Social Science. Um, today, I have the pleasure of speaking with the Golden Apple recipient, Dr. Tomer Begaz. Welcome, Dr. Begaz. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Otis. And like I said in the intro, um, Dr. Tomer Bagas is a full professor of emergency medicine and director of the undergraduate medical education in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. So um, with all that word salad that I just spit out, um, he is also a Golden Apple recipient. Now tell us a little bit more about what it takes or what entails being a Golden Apple recipient. Okay, first a minor clarification. I'm a professor at the David Geffen School of Medicine and I direct undergraduate medical education at my county hospital, which is Olive View UCLA Medical Center. Okay. Um, uh, and with regards to the Golden Apple, I, I, I don't really know. I, it's, um, it's, my understanding is it's an award that is given by the graduating class of the medical school um, to a teacher, I believe two, two recipients per year for teachers that were meaningful for their education. So um, I was very humbled to receive it because the 2020 class at the David Geffen School of Medicine is a really special uh, and brilliant and wonderful um, class. And unfortunately, there's no senior dinner to uh, wrap up the year with them because everything is virtual, like this interview is yes. virtual yes. Um, for um, social distancing reasons. Yeah. And like he said in his description of uh, the reward, he is very humble. And I, that's one of the reasons why I really appreciate you. So now I ask a question as I enter into these interviews, just to kind of loosen this up a little bit. So is there an album or a book that's helped you get through this pandemic? Um, <laughs> uh, I, album or book is pretty specific. Yeah. Um, although I'm currently reading The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay, which is a novel. And I'm about halfway through it. And it's really powerful and beautifully written. And it's about um of the early years of the aids epidemic in the 1980s in new york in chicago's um uh and uh that has a lot of parallels with covid19 in that uh at the time it was this scary disease that we didn't know very much about yeah, yeah. um and so there's a connection there um but in terms of getting me through this. Um, when I was graduating medical school, um, I took an oath uh, and it wasn't the Hippocratic oath, but it was something similar. It's called the uh, modified oath of Maimonides, mm. um, which was the oath that I chose to take at the time. And uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, I photocopied it and um, I carried it around in my wallet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't really answer your question um, specifically about albums, because as you know, I'm listening to Prince, Michael Jackson, and the Beatles, because my six-year-old is really into them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, those are two connections to your question that um, uh, resonate. Thank you for that. I mean, I really appreciate, you know, the titles and the authors that um, folks have given as answers to this question, because I think, you know, during these times in which we are you know, very much um, self-quarantining, um, we also need to, you know, have some ideas of some great things, some great books, some great, you know, albums, some great movies that potentially can kind of help us get out of our heads sometimes and help us yeah. make it through this, this point. So once again, humble in um, your, ex, your excellence, which is, you know, awesome to you know, really kind of know. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I really gravitate to you but you chose in your awesomeness, you could work at potentially any hospital here in Los Angeles or anywhere in the world, 
but you choose to work at a county hospital. Um, and I think that's very in, impactful in the moment. So tell us why, with your you know, expertise, why you choose county hospital. Uh, the hospital that I work primarily at is called Olive View uh, UCLA. It's one of three Los Angeles County hospitals. Um, and uh, it is a wonderful place to work. Um, uh, uh, the patient population is overwhelmingly an underserved, uh, mostly immigrant population. I'm a child of immigrants myself. Um, and well, I don't want to say that I have a preferred patient population because I think it's an honor to take, and I sincerely mean it, it's an honor to take care of people from all walks of life. Yeah. Um, it's particularly rewarding, I think, what we do in LA at our county hospitals because I truly believe that we provide the best care possible given financial and logistical constraints of the county. Mm -hmm. to uh, patients who might otherwise not get outstanding care. And the physicians who work at the county hospitals are the same physicians who spend the rest of their time at Ronald Reagan Hospital at UCLA. Um, and uh, so I feel really lucky uh, to get to work there. Um, I find it very rewarding to work there. Um, and not to mention the other things like my colleagues are brilliant and yeah. um, uh, the staff there is fun to work with. Yeah, you know, and I think it's a great place to work. Definitely. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why I asked that question was because we see, you know, um, in a lot of the research that's coming out about how communities are being affected uh, by this health crisis that we currently find ourselves in, we see that the impact in very vulnerable communities has um, been higher. Uh, and, Definitely. And so for that reason, you know, I really wanted to get to, you know, one, you know, the amazing work you're doing, but then also, you know, how county hospitals are really kind of potentially seeing a, a, a greater impact because I think a lot of these vulnerable communities choose the county hospitals as their primary go-to. Yeah, for a lot of reasons not the least of which is um, they don't have as many other options for access to care. Yeah. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. Our vulnerable communities, our communities of color are disproportionately impacted by this disease along with many other disease, but now with this new disease that is clearly something that we are seeing. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I think the many of the causes are uh, abundantly obvious and reflect underlying systemic racism in our society mm -hmm. uh, with regards to access to care and preventative care, because we know that people with underlying chronic disease um, uh, fare worse and uh, in a society where certain populations are at significantly greater risk of carrying underlying disease and not having it well managed that will affect their mortality from this disease. Yeah. Um, chronic lung disease is a particular risk factor and because of Again, I'm not an expert in this area, but because of systemic racism and segregation um, and pollution, um, our communities of color are in um, uh, a higher risk of lung disease and are in more densely populated areas where disease can spread mm -hmm. and are um, uh, more frequently employed as um, essential workers. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, uh, or workers who cannot um, have the luxury of what you and I are doing right now, working yeah. from our home offices. And so there are a lot of reasons for this. Again, I'm a frontline emergency physician. I'm not, not an epidemiologist, but I, the, the, these truths are self-evident. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're still in the midst of this pandemic. And at the same time, we see Los Angeles 
opening up. So, you know, just help us out as it relates to what we should be thinking about as we start to open up and go back into normalcy as it relates to our lives. What would you suggest to folks to be thinking about um, as it relates to, you know, potentially having to interact with individuals? Yeah, um, uh, we, ha we have to be careful. The disease prevalence, if anything, is growing, not going away, despite the fact that we're opening up. I have anecdotally noticed um, uh, um, there's some more space in the hospital. So um, a lot of the efforts that our um, le uh, government leadership have done have um, uh, resulted in some uh, uh, space in the hospital, but that doesn't mean that the disease has gone away. It has not gone away. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's not going anywhere. Despite the fact that we're all frustrated and cooped up, mm -hmm. um, you are still at risk of contracting this disease, which can be deadly. Yeah. And so um, the basic messages that I believe we've all heard, wash your hands, avoid touching your face, wear a mask when out in public, mostly for other people, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, be careful about um, particularly prolonged exposures where you're close to other people. Yeah. Uh, I recognize that it's inconvenient, but um, uh, those are simple measures that you can take to decrease the likelihood of contracting this disease. If you feel sick, self-isolate and avoid exposing others because it seems to be quite contagious. Yeah. Basic things, these basic things can make a big difference and um, make it safe to, safer, can mitigate the risk of some opening up of our lives. I also recognize that we can't stay in our houses uh, or apartments yeah. um, isolated forever, but we should continue to be aware. And I, again, I like this idea that it's a marathon, not a sprint, because uh, we just have to continually to remind ourselves to not let our guard down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. particularly because there's also no effective treatment for it. So when I'm out here on the marathon and I'm feeling a little bit of something happening, when should I go into the ER? How do I really kind okay. of interact with that? Um, well, uh, if you feel unwell, fever, body aches, cough, sore throat, GI symptoms, diarrhea, um, are some of the common, but not a complete list of the myriad symptoms, loss of taste and smell sensation. Um, uh, uh, those are signs that you may have this virus. And if not this virus, some other virus that's also contagious. Mm -hmm. And um, you should self-isolate and avoid exposure to others. Um, you can get tested for free locally uh, via um, if not your primary care doctor, then via LA County. Um, there's a website that you can find. I don't know it offhand. And we'll I, I use it myself. The, we'll yeah. put it in the description there. Yeah. I did it myself recently. It worked great. Uh -huh. Same day, scheduled it. Um, uh, when should you come to the hospital? There's a two part answer to that. Um, with regards to disease severity for this viral infection, um, Currently, as of today, June 15th, 2020, there's really no treatment um, that is effective for somebody who's not critically ill. Uh, and so, frankly, if you feel like you have it, but you don't feel like you're so sick that you need special intervention and hospitalization, a visit to the ER might be unsatisfying. If you're feeling very short of breath, if you're having chest pain, confusion, or just using that prudent layperson standard where you feel like there's something wrong, then I 
do recommend you come so that somebody can evaluate you, lay hands on you, check vital signs, in particular your oxygen level in your blood, which can be done non-invasively with a little finger monitor, to determine if there's something seriously wrong for which we would provide supportive care and hospitalization. But if you just feel kind of run down and fluish, honestly, the hospital doesn't have much to offer right now. The second part of that question, which I do think I need to address is, interestingly, as this new pandemic has spread in the United States, one of the things we've noticed is actually a significant decrease in emergency department visits nationwide. Okay. A significant increase in COVID-related hospitalizations, but yet net, less people have come to the hospital. And part of that can be explained by decreased traumas, because less people are out driving mm -hmm. and doing things. Less people are out at bars, getting intoxicated and getting into accidents. Right. Um, uh, you know, some of it can be explained by decreased risk of the common things that we see in the emergency department. But we suspect that another part of it is this fear of the hospital, which is preventing people who might actually have other things that could be treated in a timely fashion. You have abdominal pain in your lower belly and you might have come in and we diagnose you with appendicitis, but you're afraid to come in. Uh, and then when we do make those diagnoses, we might be making them later yeah. where the course is more complicated. And so again, using this term that we like called prudent layperson, if you in your judgment think that there might be a acute medical problem that you're concerned about that is time sensitive, then by all means come to the emergency department. At this point, we've implemented infection control standards that make it reasonably safe to come to the hospital. Uh -huh. Well, thank you so much. I, you know, I think one of the things that I feel somewhat vulnerable around as it relates to this virus is we don't get a chance a lot of times to speak with medical professionals such as yourself. And I think that lends itself to what you were just talking about as it relates to some of that fear. Um, or, you know, I don't want to come in because I don't want to receive the diagnosis. And so I really think that, you know, what you just gave to us, this video, will help some folks potentially get past that fear and do what it is to make sure that they're taking care of their health. One minor point that I'd like to add is yeah. if you happen to have the luxury of having a primary care doctor, yeah. many, if not most, have instituted telemedicine, video or telephone appointments. Okay. Um, and so uh, access to your primary care doctor in some ways has never been better because of this pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and so if you, again, have the luxury of having that access, that could be a middle ground of someone you could talk to to help make decisions about what you should do if you're feeling symptoms that you're concerned about. Golden Apple recipient, Dr. Begazo, uh, I always say that wrong, Begaz, thank you so much for your time. And thank you also for what you do to really kind of do your part in this um, new normal that we find ourselves living in. So thanks again, Doc. Otis, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. All right, take care of yourself. Okay.